Hello everybody, Pastor Brent here and Hannah behind the camera. Welcome to uh, Premier Bible Study Evening. Uh, we're glad that you are with us, uh, even if it's not on Wednesday night, some other time of the week. Good to have you with us. We're going to pray and then we're going to get into it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, which means that's the end of the book. So I think I'll probably get through it in the next 40 minutes. Who knows? Uh, Hannah says miracles can happen. So maybe we can get through this in 40 minutes or less. But uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time together again. Uh, Lord, whatever people are thinking about today, whatever people are praying about, whatever they're going through, uh, whoever they're thinking about that may be going through something, we just pray, God, that you would minister in every situation and to all needs. We do pray that you would glorify your name. We also pray, Father, that as we deal with the Bible study tonight, that again, you'll help me to, to teach it properly, clearly, and that people will have take-home stuff, that they'll be able to live out or what we're discussing tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we wrapped up 2 Timothy chapter 3 last week, talking about verse 16 was the final thought. All Scripture is God-breathed and is youthful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's a great catch. Uh, all Scripture is God-breathed. I think the, the big thing I want to mention on this that the notes touch on, if you look back on your notes, they do touch on this. The Bible says all Scripture is God breathed. Because I think some Christ followers today think that, well, the New Testament, NT, the New Testament is God breathed, but the Old Testament, not so sure about that because it's filled with so much ancient stuff and the Mosaic law, and you might be thinking, well, you know, aren't, haven't we done away with all of the feasts, and haven't we done away with the Mosaic law? And I would say this, as a means of being justified before God, yes, we've done away with all that. But nonetheless, the Old Testament passages, whether it's the feasts or the Ten Commandments or all the other laws, point us to our need of a Savior, point us to those things being given greater understanding and fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and point us to Jesus and the need for a Savior. So all Scripture is God-breathed. Sometimes we just have a harder understanding of how to apply Old Testament passages uh, to our lives. And I hope that we've done a good job here, especially teaching through books like Romans and Galatians, helping you to understand how the Old Testament Scripture fits into a, a new covenant and a New Testament life. I hope we've done a good job with that. But just remember, all Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going out to kill a goat or a lamb in order to sacrifice for sin. That doesn't mean that we can't wear garments with two different kinds of clothing in it and those kinds of things. Again, understanding the Old Covenant and its laws in a proper way that see its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to remind you about that. You're going to have unsaved people rip portions of the Old Testament out and say, well, what about this and what about that? And it's going to be very important for you to put all of that in context and put all of that not only in historical context, but also in scriptural context and looking through the lens of Christ, of the new covenant in order to understand that better. So just a reminder about that. If you have any questions about that or you need any more explanation, again, the chat line's not the place for that. Pastor at EssexGospel.com and I will help you through that. But just remember, all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for all different kinds of aspects of the Christian life. So that wraps up chapter 3 and that's just a reminder. So the segue then goes into chapter 4, and let me read some of this for you, at least to verse 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing and His kingdom, I give you this charge. So Paul is giving this charge to Timothy. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Now, I firmly believe that we are in that time. Now, I'm not saying that there haven't been past times when that's been a problem, 
but I'm saying I certainly feel that it is a current problem, especially in light of the fact that there's so much stuff out there. So let me, let me just share with you Sunday afternoon. Um, we've just got home from church. We had the welcome for the Taylor family, which by the way was awesome. Thanks for participating. And we've cleaned up, so we're getting home a little later than normal. So ballpark figure, somewhere between 1.30 and 2 o'clock, we get home. Uh, Karen and I are just chilling out because we got small groups. I got to be back at the church for quarter to six. So we're just chilling out, uh, feet up on the chair, and uh, we're having lunch, just so you know. I had scrambled eggs with toast. It was fantastic. And uh, I got some Christian television on. Uh, because there's not much going on, really. Um, and so I'm just watching some Christian television. And I, I find a channel that, uh, you know, one of the religious channels. And there's a certain guy on. And you have to understand on those religious channels, right? As long as you can pay the money, any Tom, Dick, or Harry, or Mary can get on there and talk about whatever you want. Hey, as long as you got the money, they'll put you on. And so this guy is on there. And I think it's got something to do with the world tomorrow. Hold it, world tomorrow. I don't know if that's their magazine or their church name or whatever it is. And this, this religion, this belief system believes that the 12 tribes of Israel are still alive and well today. But the 12 tribes have become, in a sense, 12 different nations. And they would look at Judah as basically the lineage of Judah and sitting on David's throne, basically working through what we would call uh, Britain and descendants of Britain. And so British Israel, in a sense. And... If you want to look that up, British Israel, put that in your Google search. I'm not sure exactly what we'll bring up, but it'll bring up some stuff. And so they're talking from a passage in Jeremiah, an Old Testament passage in Jeremiah that clearly speaks to the nation of Israel, especially the, the southern tribe of Judah, and the fact that it's either going into exile or has already entered exile. So it's clearly Jeremiah it's clearly to the tribe of Judah. They're clearly Jewish people, and it's talking about what's going to happen to them um, in the next, you know, a little while uh, in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is written, I don't know, let's say Jeremiah is written around 600 BC, give or take, somewhere in that area. So what's going to happen? And they're going to eventually, Judah's going to go into exile. Well, this, this clown... This clown is on there, and he's talking about the 12 tribes of Israel and how they've been disbanded and dispersed. And he st start, starts talking about the tribe of Reuben, the, right, the oldest. And he says, the tribe of Reuben is now the people of France. He actually said that. So while he's saying that crazy thing, I'm on the couch eating my scrambled eggs, and here again, I've lost my marbles. My, my marbles are scrambled, and I'm yelling at the TV, that's ridiculous. And of course, my poor wife is sitting beside me thinking, I've lost my mind again. Why? Because, well, how can you say that the tribe of Reuben that has been you know, disbanded and dispersed over the years, that that Jewish tribe is now the Gentile nation of France? Like, how can you say that? What scriptural basis is there for that? And, the, and here's the answer. None! There's no scriptural basis for that. This is, this is clown theology. This is clown theology. This is just nuts. And yet, this guy that's teaching that has a following and they give you free literature and people write in every day to get the free literature. And then they start teaching you this crazy stuff. So there's going to be a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. There's never been a time where there's more unsound doctrine out there. There's never been a time when there's been a greater proliferation of junk 
that they say is based on the Bible, and they always turn to the Bible. They misuse the Bible so horribly. Seriously, folks, if it wasn't absolutely tragic and leading people into error, error, E-R-R-O-R, it would, it would be laughable. It would be hysterically laughable. But people buy this, and you say, well, what does it matter if they believe the wrong stuff? Well, because <clears throat> there's this whole distortion uh, of, uh, you know, of who Israel is, the promises of God, the covenants of God, and of course, you know, uh, who Jesus is and sitting on the throne and all of that. I mean, it just, it just built. So anyways, I know I was just reading verse three, for there will come a time when men will not put up with sound doctrine. People will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, what? To suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and aside to myths. But you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations and your hardship. Do the work of evangelists. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And then Paul says, because he knows Paul's at the end of his life. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. Now, from verse 9 to the end of the chapter, verse 22, it's basically just greetings with people. And some people that have been good to him, and some people that haven't been good to him. And there's some, there's some, you know, there's some stuff there, and there's the great verse, uh, you know, where it says in verse 17, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be proclaimed to all the Gentiles, might hear it, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth, obviously Roman stuff, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's, that, those verses there, 17 and 18, are really great verses about the Lord rescuing him, the Lord standing with him, and delivering him from the lion's mouth. And that's about all I'm going to say from verses 9 to 22. Those are great verses when you're going through trials and tribulations to encourage yourself, read those, memorize those, put them deep down in your spirit. Those are really good things. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it because Paul was the chief apostle to the Gentiles. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth time and time again, right? God delivered him. And the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Meaning this, like, yeah, my departure is coming. I know I'm eventually, you know, going to be martyred. I'm sure Paul understood that. But he knew that he would be entering into the heavenly kingdom and he would find his place of rest. So verses 17 and 18, 2 Timothy 4, that's all I'm going to say on the verses from 9 below. Uh, those are really good and look those up. All the rest is just personal stuff and comments on people that had helped or that had hindered the gospel. But I want to get into the stuff that I just talked about, because again, what I've shared with you through the lessons and in the PowerPoint presentations is I believe that 2 Timothy has a lot to say about our times. And although it's a message or a letter that was written 2,000 years ago, it is still very relevant, uh, <laughs> relevant. I don't even know if that's a word. It is still very relevant today. And so I want to keep that in front of you. This is just a reminder that the word of God, all scriptures, God breathed. And because it's God breathed, it speaks every day to us. If we take the time to read it, study it, listen to it and do it, it speaks every day because it is the living word of God. So, Chapter 4, verse 1, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and that's biblically true, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we are all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, um, and that is for believers. Uh, the Greek word is bima. Uh, the bima seat was a place in a Roman or a Greek city where the judge would handle cases, the, the public cases, and so Paul uses that Roman Greek happening. And he says, it's like that in heaven too, where Jesus is going to judge those who are Christ followers, and you are going to be rewarded for the work that you've done in the body. So we are going to, we are going to be um, judged for the works done in the body, not judged for whether or not 
uh, we're Christians, but it's going to be about the work that we've done. What have you done for Jesus as a Christ follower? And so all of that is, is stated for us in the Bible. And, you know, we are just reminded about that uh, in a number of places. We're reminded about that in 1 Corinthians, where we're told, you know, that it matters the works we do, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, good or bad, um, you know, gold or silver, so to speak. But it also says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And so again, that's Paul writing to a church, writing to Christians today, and we are going to be judged according to our works. Now, judged here means God is going to pass judgment on what we did for him. rather good or bad. Now, good or bad doesn't mean that we did awful things for God. Some did good things and some did awful things. Some people did things that mattered and bore fruit, and some didn't. So rewards will be few. Here, rewards will be many. And again, there's a reference in 1 Corinthians, not only in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, but there's also the references in, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, beginning, oh, let's say at verse 10 uh, to verse 15. So there's 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, and there's also 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 to 15, where it talks about your works and your rewards. So that's what the, the, the bima seat here is. Bima is the Greek word. The judgment seat of, of Christ. So Paul tells us this. He Paul tells Timothy this. He tells us this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. Now, it also means this. It also means all living and all dead. So Christ will also judge those who are unsaved. I mean, we know that's going to happen as well, those that are unsaved. And the final judgment of that is found over in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it says that God is going to do that for us as well. Uh, chapter 20 of Revelation, verse 4, I saw thrones in which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus, and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads or hands. And they came and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So um, Jesus with others are, are, are judging those that suffered uh, during the tribulation, and they, they have... Um, uh, you know, been saved and they are going to be raised and ruled with Jesus for the thousand years. And you can read all of that. And then at the very end in Romans chapter 11, those that who died that were unsaved, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it and earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So there's the judgment of the dead and the living, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and also the references found for us in Revelation chapter 20, meaning those who were saved during the trib. And they're resurrected. And then again in Revelation 20, those who were unsaved and they are judged and then sent away. And it says this, uh, verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, 
he was thrown into the lake of fire. So even though, even though the Apostle Paul just touches on this, you know, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, um, like, even though he just gives kind of one line to it, all of this is involved, you know, saved, being rewarded, judged and rewarded for their works, not whether or not they're, they're saved. We know they're saved. This isn't about judgment for salvation. It's again, saved, it's all about their works and the rewards. And I commented on that. And then over here, there's the saved of the trib. Again, during the tribulation that are saved, that are resurrected and are, are brought to life before the final judgment call of God on those who are unsaved and are sent to the lake of fire. So again, there's lots to it. The Bible has lots to say about that. I'm just giving you some references, some points to, to look at. Revelation 20, uh, you know, the whole chapter would be good for you to read. And then 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 and 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. Again, so that you'll have a, a better understanding of, well, what does that mean? Who will judge the living and the dead? And how they will be judged? And what's the difference between Christians and non-Christians, right? So in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, right? I give you this charge. So let me keep that on and just flip the board. Nice clean board there for you that I can mess up with my sloppy running. Before we do that, it is time to wet the whistle. You know how it is. You just seem to get along better with your work when you're fresh and refreshed through the day. So because I know you people care about this, you know that I like to bring a, a can or a bottle of Coke uh, to Bible study time. I always try to bring a bottle because I like uh, pop out of a bottle better. But here's the thing. Six bottles of eight ounce Coke is $6.99 now. Six cans of eight ounce Coke is $3.99. And um, talk about inflation, right? So I told my wife and she knows, like we're not buying bottles for $6.99. That's just a crazy price. So we'll stick to the cans. You know, a little tinny taste, but hey, Coke is Coke. So it's still good. It's still cold. It still refreshes. But not for six ninety nine. dollars <clears throat> mm -mm. Well, I remember you could buy a case of pop, real pop, not the no-name stuff, real pop. And yes, there's a difference for six ninety nine. dollars Ah, the good old days. Those days are gone. So Paul says to Timothy, in the view of his appearing, that Jesus is coming, his, his kingdom is going to be fulfilled, I give you this charge. Why do I write, write the word charge on here? Because charge is like a, a, a commissioning. It's, it's basically Paul's final plea to Timothy. I give you this charge. I give you this solemn duty and responsibility. I give you this final speech, my final words to you, perhaps, my final thoughts. This is a big deal. A charge is a commission for Timothy to do something. Timothy, do this. I give you this charge. Timothy, take this on. Be responsible for it. Get it done, right? I give you this charge. What's the charge? First of all, preach the word. Now, again, in those days... There weren't too many paper Bibles around, if there were any, at least not of the New Testament. There may have been some fragments of Mark's gospel, maybe some of Paul's early writings, moving from church to church, being copied and handed around. But in and around this time, 62 AD, let's remember, right? The whole New Testament hadn't been put together yet. Some of the New Testament hadn't even been written yet. God hadn't even revealed some of that to some of them. Uh, John's Gospels uh, probably come later. Uh, the book of Revelation probably comes 30 years later after this. So 
All of this or most of this is very verbal, you know, other than using Old Testament scriptures and just telling the stories of Jesus and the gospel writers audibly and verbally. So preach the word. Number one, commission to Timothy as an evangelist. Be prepared in season and out of season. So the whole idea, you know what this means, being prepared in season and out of season. Be ready at all times. Be ready to preach the word and to handle the word of God properly and times you expect to do it. And then also be ready to do it at times you don't expect to do it. Let me give you an example of this. Just last week, a young lady showed up at our church. Uh, she's from another country. Uh, she's here, uh, you know, um, education and job. And she um, needs some help. And she comes in on a Thursday. And, uh, you know, we're very happy to help her, want to help her, want to be a blessing to her. But all of a sudden, right, you, I, I'm getting ready to go to Bible study. Pastor Jess and Pastor Adam are getting ready to go to a minister's meeting. And so they're basically heading out the door and I'm heading to Bible study and this young lady comes in. So it's great, you know, um, other people pitched in, Karen Hamilton pitched in and other people pitched in in order to, to help her out. But the whole idea was we weren't ready for her. Um, she didn't have an appointment, but we were ready for her because we love God and we love God's word and we wanted to reach out to her and help her. And so we did. Being prepared in season and out of season, when you expect and when you don't expect. I'm happy to say that the young lady showed up again on Sunday. What her future holds, I have no idea. But folks, you just never know. When you and I are going to be called to share the gospel, or you and I are going to be called to live the gospel for somebody. So be prepared in season and out of season. Not just on Sundays, not just on Bible study nights or prayer meeting nights, but be prepared in season and out of season. And I like the way the fact that he uses the word season. I don't know if he used the word season to mean a longer period of time or not, or it was just words that he chose. But I like the idea of seasons because in Canada, we have four seasons, right? And they last three months long. So there are periods of time when you are, you know, you know you're going to be involved and you're going to be called upon. And then there might be prolonged periods of time where, you, you know, it seems out of season to you but you're gonna to need to be ready. So be ready, in season and out of season. For what? Using the word of God. Using the word of God and as led by the Holy Spirit to correct, rebuke, and encourage. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Now the reason why I said according to the word of God and as led by the Spirit, let me put that over here. The idea here is, is correcting people according to the Word of God. The whole idea here is, is, is not so much correcting their conduct, their behavior. Here, it's, it's a sense of theology, their doctrine, um, their beliefs. Now, it doesn't mean that it couldn't include correcting how people live. But the whole idea is, right, is Jesus first, the gospel first, getting that right and allowing room for the Holy Spirit to sort that out in people's lives. If you have people that are clearly following a doctrine, a practice of belief that is leading into all kinds of immorality, obviously you might have to correct. But you also want to do it, as Paul tells us, with a gentle spirit. And he refers to that reference in another passage of the scripture. I, I can't recall it right now, but I'll have it in your notes. I'll have it in your notes. But with a gentle spirit, right? Uh, do that with a gentle spirit. He says here, with great patience. Because people that are in error will tax you with great patience and careful instruction. So the idea here is, is that when you're correcting somebody, if you do it in a mean-spirited way, if you do it in a really authoritarian way, you might turn people off. 
just by, you know, nobody likes being shouted at. So correct people, their theology, rebuke if they're, you know, if they're clearly in the wrong. But again, try to do it with a, a gentle spirit. Rebuke sounds like a really harsh word. You know, I really rebuked them. I really gave it to them. They were in the wrong and I let them have it. So again, let's, let's maintain the attitude of Christ. Rebuke. Sometimes you need to be strong in that, depending on who the person is or the personality, but be careful. But it also says everything doesn't sound so corrective or somewhat negative. Also encourage people. Encourage people in their faith. I mean, there are people going around saying that, uh, you know, the resurrection's already happened. There's people going around saying Jesus has already come and you missed him. People need to be encouraged with proper instruction. So Paul says to Timothy, with great patience and careful instruction, correct rebuke and encourage. We also know from other passages of scriptures, and again, I'll do my best to have that in the notes. I hope that from the time I walk here and make sure the notes are in proper order that I don't forget that. But with a gentle spirit, this whole idea of gentle spirit is dealing with people that are unsaved. You know, do it with some grace. Let me just put grace here too. Try to show some grace, right? Um, so correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Again, great patience and careful instruction is because A, you know, uh, people that are in error or don't know need careful instruction. And they need great patience because that can be challenging sometimes. It can be exasperating, to be frank, dealing with some people who just don't want to believe. It can be exasperating dealing with some people who want to believe something that is different. I was partially exasperated on Sunday from this, I think, again, World Tomorrow guy going up there saying, you know, France, the people of France, modern France are descendants of Reuben. Like, you know, the only thing that's a descendant of Reuben in France is a Reuben sandwich if they have it. That's it, folks. Okay. It's just, again, I don't want to stay here too long, but again, it's just, it's crazy what people will believe into these days. And when people are on TV or they got a podcast or they wrote a book, they have instant credibility. They have instant believability. Well, they must be okay. They're on TV. They must be okay. They dress nice. They must be okay. They represent a good religious organization. They must be okay. No. No. No, they mustn't necessarily be okay. Why? Verse 3, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. There's going to come a time when people don't want to listen to sound doctrine. And again, I think that could have happened at any time between now and when all of this was written and any time moving forward. But I, I, again, I especially think that that is true today, that people will not put up with sound doctrine. And it isn't always a stranger trying to get you to believe something weird. It could be somebody very close to you trying to get you to believe something weird. It could be, quote, a well-meaning father-in-law or mother-in-law, a well-meaning father or mother a spouse, a sister or brother, an aunt or an uncle, a nephew or a niece. You're the guy sitting beside you in the pew on Sunday. You know, we always think it's some wackadoodle, like, like I talk about sometimes on TV. It could be the people around you that won't put up with sound doctrine. So be very careful, folks. Be very careful. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine means the truth. It's sound. It, 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 it's, it's in good shape. It can weather storms. It's solid. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. That's what the word sound means here. It's like a boat that's put out on the water. That's sound that's in good shape. It can endure the pound, pound, pound of hitting the waves or the storms, right? It's in good shape. It's not rusting out. It's not rotting out. It's not taking on water. It's not linking, leaking. It's not going to sink on you. It's sound. It's trustworthy. It's reliable. There's going to be a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. What will they do? Instead, to suit their own desires. Let me put that up here. They want to believe and they want to teach what they want to believe and teach because it suits them. 
there is some gain that they're getting from it. Whatever it is, it might be financial gain, but it's not always financial gain. Some people just want a crowd. Some people really believe a lie and want other people to believe what they believe, and they don't recognize it as a lie. But it's a lie. Again, they don't recognize it as a lie. They don't feel that they're, you know, perpetuating lies. There are people listening to me probably from time to time that think that I'm perpetuating lies from what I'm teaching here. Now, I don't believe that I am, but you know, hey, um, that's just the reality. Depending on where you land, you think somebody else is lying. Now you say, well, Pastor Brent, what makes you think that you're teaching the truth? Because I think, I believe that the, I am following sound, well-recognized biblical principles, uh, orthodox principles of how to handle the scriptures. And so I think because there is, you know, thousands of years of how to properly handle the scriptures and that I'm doing that and studying to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, that I think you can trust me. But I, again, I'll tell you, there'll be people that believe something else will say the same thing. I think I'm following really good hermeneutical principles. But here's where push comes to shove. The guy that was teaching on Sunday that the people of France are descendants from Reuben has no biblical foundation for that. There's no exegetical foundation for that. There's, there's no nothing for that. That's just corny, right? That's just corny. And so there are some things that are just absolutely indefensible and they just mishandle scripture. Why? Because they are uh, suiting their own desires and they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So it's interesting. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers. It isn't the teachers gathering the followers. It's the followers gathering the teachers. Look how this is read here. You may not have noticed that. They will, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So it's not teachers in this sense. Now, it is sometimes. But it's not teachers trying to get a following. It's people who want to hear a certain thing and that they will gather teachers around them to say what they want to hear. Has there ever been a time where that has been more accessible than today? Let me make my point. My point is this. Back in the good old days, teachers were out there, itinerant teachers, and you'd have to go to a town or a city or a church or whatever to hear them, and then to sort out what they're teaching. And then you would vote yay or nay on whether you liked it. But you had to go find them right? You had to go where they were. And if you liked what they were selling, that was fine. Today, you can go on YouTube. You can go on Instagram. You can go on Facebook. You can go on a podcast, Spotify or Amazon. You can go on this Christian radio station or that Christian radio station. You can go on Daystar or 100 Huntley Street. You can do I mean, here's the thing, and you can gather around yourself via media and technology teachers that are, going, uh, that are saying things that you like. And so you turn the ones on you like, and you turn off the ones you don't. In other words, you have gathered the teachers around you. They have come to you through video, through audio to you. Ken Copeland comes to you. Brent Horner comes to you. Jerry Smyer comes to you. Billy Graham comes to you and, and he's not even alive anymore. I mean, all of us come to you and you click on or click off those you like. So it's not the teachers gathering the followers, it's the followers gathering the teachers that say what they want to hear, fulfilling their own evil desires. And this generation is the first generation that can do that in ways never imagined before. You can, you can, bring into your iPhone or your iPad or your TV set anybody these days from around the world and click on if you like what they're saying or click off. And you can set up a schedule of all the ones that say the things that you want to hear to suit your own desires and ignore the rest. And no sound doctrine can touch you if you don't want it to. Never been a time like this time. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, to false doctrines, to gobbledygook. But in light of that, Timothy, you keep your head in all situations, 
Keep your head in all situations because sometimes you feel like you're losing it. Endure hardship. Yes, Timothy, I know you're timid. I know things are tough. Endure hardship, however. Do the hard work. Do the work of the evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Timothy, be faithful to God because I'm leaving soon. And I need to know that you've got this. I need to know that I've entrusted to reliable people the gospel of Jesus Christ and that when I finish my race and I fought the good fight and Jesus takes me home, I know that there are men and women following behind that are going to be faithful to the gospel. Yes, it's tough, but God's given you a, a spirit of, of love, power, and a sound mind. Timothy, keep going. Scripture's God-breathed. It's powerful. There's going to be all kinds of people in your day that aren't going to want to listen to it, but do the good work. Folks, those are good words for you and I. Do the good work. You may not call yourself an evangelist or an pastor, but do the good work. Keep your head in all situations. Understand that we're living in a time that sound doctrine isn't liked. People are gathering around themselves. All kinds of false teachers or teachers, whatever it is that they want to hear, that many times is contrary to the gospel. And so because of that, getting the truth out, getting people to follow the truth is going to be hard work. But do it with grace, a gentle spirit, patience, and careful instruction, and God will make you a blessing to the masses. So there we are. I could say lots. I'm really passionate about these verses 3, 4, and 5, but I've probably said uh, enough. And so our time is up. God bless you. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the study in 2 Timothy. Again, if you have any questions or comments, pastor at essexgospel.com. Come. If you'd like the notes, I'll send you the notes. We have had some requests from others for the notes, and I've been able to do that, so that's great. So keep asking for them if you're not getting them, if you're viewing this. Pastor at Essex Gospel. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord.